Hey, everybody. We're in the green room. We're talking about when not to dig near Chernobyl. Some people didn't get their lessons <laughs> in high school. Um, anyway, <laughs> we're not talking about that. We're actually here with Disrupt TV. Welcome to our, bat, our green room, and we're getting some quick introductions in reverse order. Uh, we'll start with Larry, who's got a new role he'll share with you. Uh, Steve, and then we'll get to Heather and Ken. So go ahead, Larry. What's going on? Where are we calling from, and what are we talking about? Um, outside Philadelphia, we're talking about... Uh, my new gig at Salonis Media, probably a little process mining and God knows what else. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Whatever else we wing. <laughs> Steve, go ahead. Hey, uh, I am coming to you from uh, Sydney, Australia, before breakfast on a Saturday morning, but it's beautiful. It's a, um, we're, getting, we're getting some rain down under, you may know. But um, hey, look, I uh, look after digital safety and privacy at Constellation. We're going to be talking decentralization today. Uh, I think uh, Val has reminded us that we've got about 20 minutes to cover uh, everything, decentralization, privacy, security, and, and stuff on the leading edge with our guests. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for having me again. Very, very cool. Heather, where are you calling from? What are we talking about today? Hi, I'm calling in from downtown Washington, D.C., where we are at the peak of cherry blossom season. It's a great time to be here. And Ken and I, we're going to be talking about trusted digital ecosystems that allows um, individuals, organizations, things share authoritative data um, across an ecosystem without any kind of direct integration to the source. Very, very cool. Hey, thank you. Ken, where are you calling in from? I'm uh, south of Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, here to talk about decentralized identity and how to make it a, a a real live implementation for our users. All right, very, very cool. Well, hey, welcome. We're gonna do a count. We can save the video and here we'll take off. So ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the Chief Digital Evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, our distinguished guests, your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host. He's Ray Wong. He's the CEO founder of Constellation Research. He's the best-selling author of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Surviving and Thriving in a World of Digital Giants. Ray's a regular contributor on television, business, and technology uh, on CNBC, Fox Business, The Wall Street Journal, and others. He's a global sought-after keynote speaker, and in my humble opinion, one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWAG0. Welcome, Ray Wong, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm here with Vala Ashar, the Chief Digital Evangelist for Salesforce. He's also the author of The Pursuit of Social Business Excellence. Executives around the world are paying attention to every one of his insightful and inspirational tweets. Uh, when he's not tweeting, keynoting, or leading events at Salesforce, you can find him speaking on business TV outlets such as Bloomberg and posting insightful analyses on ZDNet. But it's not about us. It's always about our amazing guests. Who do we have today to kick it off? Please give me the opportunity to introduce our next two guests. We have Heather Dahl, the co-founder and CEO of Indicio. Uh, through her vision and leadership, Indicio has become a global leader in decentralized identity, launching a blockchain-based distributed network on five continents, creating the first implementation of a complete ecosystem for sharing privacy, preserving uh, digital health credentials, which was donated to the Linux Foundation Public Health for use by public health agencies across the world and developing a series of innovation software to manage identity and data sharing. Now, Heather is a pioneer in data privacy and security. She led the research team and developed the idea of decentralization as a solution to online security. Previously, Heather was the chair of the Congressional Correspondence Association. She also chaired the board of National Press Foundation, where she led the organization's digital transformation. 
You can follow Heather on Twitter at Heather C. Dahl. Heather C. D. A. H. L. Welcome, Heather, to Disrupt TV. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Heather. And with Heather, we have Ken Ebert, the CTO for Indicio, where he leads a team of over 20 expertly trained and experienced architects, developers, and senior leaders actively leading the decentralized identity community. Indicio is becoming the market leader in developing trusted data ecosystems, providing companies with a complete suite of software and network infrastructure needed to authenticate and exchange high value information and develop trusted, secure relationships. Ken is deeply knowledgeable in open standards such as verifiable credentials and decentralized identity specifications coming out of the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, and promotion of the adoption and compliance with standards. Welcome, Ken, to Disrupt TV. Hi, great to be here. It's an exciting time in the, the evolution of uh, digital identity. It sure is. It sure is. Well, hey, I'm I'm coming an imposter here. Our expert on digital identity is actually be next, <laughs> Wilson. So I'm going to ask some questions here. I'm actually put him in as well uh, into this panel to get in the mix. But the question is, um, we we know identity is important, right? And we're moving from Web two to Web three. We're moving to centralized to decentralized, right? Uh, we've had terms like self sovereign identity, decentralized identity. These things have all come about, and you know and we're still talking about two-factor authentication on some sites, right? It's it's horrible. So what's going on? Let's get the state of the state uh, between all these different definitions. And of course, how do we solve this basic problem of identity, especially in a digital world? So. I think it's it's really important to look at what 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 is the reason for identity in the first place? Like, what are we trying to solve? And in the last year, one of the biggest revelations I had in this space was I was having a conversation with the global enterprise who was actually trying to solve a health data challenge where they were trying to share mm -hmm. some health information from one party to another and they didn't want to do a direct integration. And I was saying, well, we need to talk about digital identity, decentralized identity, self-sovereign identity, user-centric identity, you, you name your identity. And they can say, no, 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 our problem is not with identity. Our problem is over here. We're trying to share health data without direct integrations. And that made me realize it's actually, identity is a part of the solution. And <laughs> We need to be talking about the solutions and not have someone expect to call us up and say, I have an identity problem because chances are their, I, their problem is at a layer above and identity is one component of solving the total ecosystem problem, or in this case, trying to create a complete ecosystem powered with perhaps a self-sovereign identity as a part of it. And so what you're talking about is it's identity by design. It's not something as an afterthought, right? Yeah. Or something as a bolt on, right? We have to begin at that kind of level to actually have a real dialogue. It's right. important. It's, I think it's really important though, to consider that identity is not what they want to talk about. They want to talk about their solution. They don't care about zero knowledge proofs and they don't care about the cryptography. What they care about is how does this tie into my existing uh, system? How does this make things better for us, make it more secure? How does it make it so that it's more uh, smooth of a, of a transaction and uh, that the fraud and other problems are eliminated? But they don't, really don't want to talk about cryptography, even though I find that fascinating. That's not the, the first topic that uh, a typical customer oh, wants to delve into. CKPs are not on your list? I mean, come on. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry. No, no when, when I hear systems and ecosystems, I think about the importance of standards in, in order to get to that tipping point of adoption. I think about, you know, what TCP IP did for the internet or HTTP did for the web. Yeah, how did decentralized entity emerge as a solution and how much work is there being done actively to create the standards or interoperability framework for, for solutions to, to scale? Across think, ecosystems. Right. I think when you talk about where did this come from, I mean, this was 10, 15 years in, in the making. So we're going back a number of years here. But in the beginning, when I got involved with it, the question was, how do we reduce the impact of the massive centralized database breach? This was in the time of the Sony math hacks are all over the news. Now it seems like one just rolls through your news feed every minute sometimes. But that was the original question which I got involved in it. And I got involved in it looking at it from a security perspective is what can we do? And part of that was how can we decentralize 
So we don't have this massive database of information. And from that, that's how I moved into this concept of decentralized identity. You can also see the DNA of that in zero trust, right? Mm -hmm. Never trust, always verify. Well, how are you going to verify who you're going to verify and where's that verification going to come? And are you just creating another trove of information from the verification that you're trying to solve with the zero trust approach? We complicated? We made the problem worse? Is that even possible? <laughs> Typically, as the, the technology ma matures, it, it transfers from a discussion about is this possible to how does this actually get deployed into a real life uh, situation? Interoperability is key there because if you have seven different people doing it seven different ways, then it doesn't really grow and get the critical mass that it needs to be mm -hmm. fully adopted. But I, I think pushing towards interoperability, pushing for what works today, and then how do we evolve that to enhance it or make it stronger or better in the future is the, the way to go. The standards are fairly solid now so that uh, people can deploy with confidence that it's going to be something that's interoperable. More work needs to be done to polish and mature and make things more readily deployable. Um, and that's the, the next phase that I see uh, exciting phases. We see people rolling into production and then uh, working on scaling. So can, can you give us some examples of, uh, you know, how certain industries, sectors are using verifiable credentials and decentralized identity? Um, there's a couple of different areas. I think uh, where the pain is highest is where the, the, the need is greatest. And so you see the early adopters in uh, tr uh, travel, international travel, getting uh, travel. COVID solved and uh, being able to, to push travel back towards something that's more normal or feasible. Um, I, I think you see that in banking, where there's a high level of fraud and there's a, a lot of dollars at risk. So how do you identify the both the customer that you're dealing with mm -hmm. and how does the customer identify you as a bank or a, a trusted source that they're talking to so they're not being fished? Those are, those are a couple of industries that are pushing on this now. Age-restricted products are a, a, a constant source of uh, um, problems, uh, making sure that, that underage people are not consuming them and that the, the regulatory uh, aspects are being complied with. Those are three that I see that are immediately popping up, but uh, passwordless login, uh, employee credentials, educational credentials, all of those are uh, also emerging rapidly. It's, there's a lot of demand, pent up demand. And mm -hmm. as soon as a solution is available, I think you're, uh, you see the, those types of industries adopting uh, quickly. Ken, Heather, when you see over the last 30 days, 4 million Ukrainian refugees, does that accelerate the importance and the need for individuals to be able to have portability in terms of their verifiable credentials? Absolutely. And it underscores exactly why we do what we do. And DCO is a public benefit corporation. Mm -hmm. And so we are mission driven. And we know that you need to have the ability to hold your own data, your own information, your own birth certificates, identification numbers. And so this is something we've been driving for prior to the what, what's going on in Ukraine. And um, what we see in Ukraine is that you have massive amounts of individuals who need access to information that are probably stored in centralized databases. Yeah. And they probably don't have access. And when they are, are now refugees trying to survive and create new lives in some cases, um, they don't have access to that and they have to start from the beginning. And that is something that Ken, myself, and the entire Indicio team is dedicated towards advancing this technology to help solve exactly problems like this, to help bring digital dignity to humanity across the world. Terrific. Wow, that's a big shift, right? And when you think about that shift to, you know, uh, where we are today to uh, where we're headed in the future, does it have to happen on the blockchain? Can they do it in a different way? Um, you know, that's, that's a question I know my, my colleague would dying to ask, right? So. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I think well, it, Ken and I were just talking about this yesterday. We think the ledger or the blockchain is actually the least interesting, most boring part of what we do. It is a tool and a component of what makes these ecosystems work, but it's not the sexiest, most glamorous part of it. But it's funny because people want to talk to us about the blockchain all the time. And so we say it's an important part, but it's just like when you talk about your 
you know, your car, you're not saying, oh, let's talk about your tires first. Let's really <laughs> dive into that, right? You're like, yeah, they're important. They're cool. I love the hubcaps on. I'm thinking about getting some new ones, but let's talk about my overall car, what it looks like, how I'm detailing it, and my next car I might buy. And so that's where blockchain is in these solutions. It is a very important part but it is not the exciting part that we love to talk about and where we see true impact happening. Ken can talk a little bit more about his side of this conversation. And I'm gonna add my colleague, Steve Wilson, who I know is dying to jump in here. He's, he's, the, he's the guy that should be here interviewing you and talking about this. So give me a second, I'm gonna add him in. Ken, go ahead, yeah, keep talking. We love to have Steve. Steve. <laughs> I, think, I think talking about the, the, the blockchain is like talking about the ship's anchor you have to have one. <laughs> it's kind of convenient to be able to anchor credentials to a blockchain, but I don't think that that is where the, the true value is added. That's kind of the baseline functionality. Uh, the real in interesting things happen in, in the agents that represent the entities that are involved, whether they're an issuer of a credential, whether they're a person or, or organization that holds a credential, or whether they're a verifier relying on the data. That's where the interesting stuff happens, particularly at the verification part. Um, Issuers have to be there, but verification is where most of the interesting bits happen because that's where value is derived typically. It can be derived in other places too, but, but that's where they're looking at what is the data that's been securely transferred? Do I, do I know that it came from a trusted source and has it been uh, tampered with along the way? And if, the, if they can answer those questions adequately, then they can make good business decisions that cost less to make and, and to reduce risk for them. That's the important part. That's where I see the fun happening. And that's what's happening now. It's my privilege to defer to Steve for the next question. <laughs> if he has one, or uh, please. I do, and I, I want to avoid answers because this is not my show, but look, thanks for having me. Um, I will say that I think the question about blockchain has got to do with what are you going to decentralize? Um, mm -hmm. Blockchain is, is, is an insanely interesting way of decentralizing some sorts of decision-making like double spending originally, and, and nowadays it's about the uniqueness of, of self-published identifiers. Mm -hmm. Now, we're rapidly getting really geeky and really technical. Um, <laughs> I think what Ken and Heather have said is, is spot on. Um, you talk to people about identity and they don't want identity. They want solutions. They want data sharing. They want autonomy. They want to have self-determination. So cool. I, I guess my question to you guys to, to help drill in, what parts of your world do you want to see decentralized and, and what parts aren't? You know, if, where are the sources of truth and what is it that you want to decentralize? I think being able to decentralize who controls my identity is an important aspect that puts the control back with the end user. It helps be, us be compliant with GDPR and the California Protection Act and so forth. But all, of, all that is uh, kind of allows the user to move to the center of the stage and become the star of the show. That's what I think is really exciting about it. There are bits of this that are not fully decentralized. When you uh, host all your agents in the cloud, is that a de fully decentralized system? But I think a realistic approach is an, is an evolutionary approach to integrating these things in with existing systems so that the benefits can be derived by all of the parties there to, to their mutual benefit. Is it a pure solution? Not always. but. Uh, as we move more and more towards decentralization, I think it puts the benefits in the hands of the end users. It benefits the issuers and verifiers. It reduces their risk as well. So everybody wins in that situation. No, that's a great point. Uh, Heather, Ken, uh, what are the top one or two blockers? Is it just too new? Lack of understanding of the benefits? Is it technical debt? Is it skill set within different organizations? What's keeping? What's what are the some of the blockers that we need to overcome for this to become mainstream? Is there an option D, all of the above? <laughs> Is there, um, everything you've talked about can be seen as a blocker or mm -hmm. what, I, what I see right now is just an area that people are actually gaining interest in. And it starts with learning, right? If you don't understand, if you don't know how to start putting together a use case, that becomes a blocker just because you need to learn more. And um, Ken and I and the entire NTCO team are very out front talking, try to publish as much research information, doing workshops, training. We will talk till you say no more about decentralized <laughs> identity just to help with the education. But when it goes down to the actual technical deployment and taking this to production and getting it in the hands of all our grandmothers and grandfathers mm -hmm. who can actually do it to 
but to solve or execute something in their daily life, it's actually about creating the technology that mm -hmm. is a full ecosystem, that you have all the parts and pieces that work and that they're interoperable. And so that you have that ability to share these credentials and claims amongst a variety of parties to take an information from one industry, maybe your employer, hmm. and port that information or identity to another industry, maybe your bank, for the purposes in another industry of a mortgage to buy a house, right? And so that is what we have been committed to advancing. What I love about what Ken and I do is that we are in the trenches with global enterprises, with governments on the ground. I'll be on the ground next week. <laughs> I'm doing deployments and implementations, and there's nothing like seeing an emerging technology that has been talked about in communities for years, actually rubber meets the road, deployment, mm. and seeing people on the ground who you don't work with and are not related to actually <laughs> using it. And so when I look at what do we have to focus on to make this happen and really go mainstream, interoperability. And that's something Steve and I actually like to talk about and send DMs to each other on. <laughs> and, what's the, and what's the biggest learning when there is an implementation? What, are there common ahas? That, that there are some of these? really good aha moments. Yeah. And it usually happens before they finish their first proof of concept. They go, mm -hmm. oh, that's how it works. I can do uh, have a credential that represents the other thing. Can you add that into the system? And there's this oh. one more thing and this one more thing. And that's kind of how it rolls. But that's wow. the, the baby step approach to it. If you start small, figure out how it works and gain some experience with it, then you have the confidence to go forward with more complex systems. And I think that's a, a good learning for everybody. Uh, it's a journey. We're here. We help people along that journey. But the idea is, is learn, figure out, try it a little bit, and then then uh, go for a, a bigger, large scale uh, production deployment. I have to ask this question: What are the implications for Web 3.0 and the metaverse? Um, will we be able to have that interoperability? And it's not a show it? unless Ray brings up metaverse. So, <laughs> yeah, and absolutely, and that's an area that we are in with both feet, working with clients on. Um, in fact, Indicio helped found the IEEE Spatial Web Working Group. But when we look at the metaverse, and I, I'll have people call me and say, Heather, I'm not quite sure about this metaverse and identity, and I don't know why we need it. And I say it's the ultimate in personalization. What if I can be in the metaverse and I don't, all I can do is a high five and be able to verify in the metaverse that I truly am Heather? and do that using verifiable credentials and enable all the privacy. Or if I want to go to an age-restricted you know, location in the metaverse, that I can do so and I know, you know for a brand or a company operating an age-restricted area, that they have confidence that everyone in their particular area meets the governance requirements to be there. Darn, you found my underaged avatar. We're in trouble. <laughs> when, when you introduce the metaverse, you double your identity problem because now you have real people trying to act, interact with virtual people and you have uh, double the problems. But the, the same problems that exist in the regular universe are uh, magnified in the metaverse. And so if you can get a, a good basis for identification and, and clearly associating identities of a real person and a, and a virtual person, an avatar, then you have the, a stronger foundation on which to have relationships of trust. And that's that's a really important factor. My last, Heather, my last my... question, do you need to have the CIO or the CFO as ex exec sponsor for project implementation to begin, to a technologist and someone that understands compliance issues related to identity? I'd say no. I think you can start with start small with a just the the either a, a marketing person or a business person or okay. an engineer that plays with it. Once they understand what they're 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 dealing with and get a better foothold there, then they can explain it to their, their partners inside of an organization, whether it's explain it to the CFO or explain it to the marketing and sales organization, how it's going to benefit them. But so start with a pilot. Start with a pilot. Start with a pilot. Yeah. Proof of concept. Yeah. Okay. Right. Makes sense. Right. 
Um, I, all I can say is like I have to converge the timelines of my avatars. I've got too many clones. Uh, we will get back to you again. We're thankful for having you here. Heather Dalsey of Indicio and of course Ken Ebert, Chief Technical Officer. You can follow Heather at H-E-A-T-H-E-R-D-A-H-L and of course you can follow the company uh, Twitter handle at I-N-D-C-I-O-I-D. So thanks a lot for being on the show. Thanks. For Thank, you, Heather. For being Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Now we we get to even uh, dive deeper into these topics. We're here with Steve Wilson, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research, focusing on digital uh, identity and privacy. Steve's coverage area span the business research themes of digital safety and privacy, data to decisions and consumerization of IT. Steve's advisory services to CIOs, CISOs, and CPOs and IT architects include security practice benchmarking, privacy engineering, and privacy impact assessment. You can follow Steve on Twitter at Steve underscore Lockstep, L-O-C-K-S-T-E-P. Welcome back, Steve, to the Shrub TV. Oh, no, we've got you on mute. We'll have to take you off real quick. That's me. <laughs> Great to see you guys. Great, Great to, to see you. Back. Great to see you. Yeah, so Steve, you know, we were talking about this. We were talking about where identity is headed, uh, massive future, uh, you know, a critical component of where we're heading in our digital lives. Um, let's take a step back. Let's go 20,000 feet up and say, what are the top privacy threats that we're seeing in 2022? Yeah, What's happening yeah, right now? Yeah, wasn't that, wasn't that interesting? Um, the privacy threats that we have are kind of baked into the, the words that we use and the approaches that we take. Um, what Heather said about talking to people about what they want in data sharing, the last thing they say is identity. So, I mean, I, I'm a proud T-shirt wearing member of the Identorati, but I think we are the only industry that I can think of where the name of our game is wrong. We're, we're, we are selling, we're dealing, we're talking about something that our customers don't want. We know they don't want it. The challenge for us is to stop talking about identity because it's a word that's not really serving the purpose anymore. And I say that relative to privacy, because of course, if you if you subliminally obsess about identity, and if identity is the is the frame you use to talk about your job, you wind up over identifying, mm -hmm. you, you wind up shooting too high. Um, and, and I think everything that we're doing in identity is sort of personifying stuff that should be really dry. I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't want to be emotional about identity. I want to be really clear. So let's have some design thinking. Here's the privacy problem. We need design thinking. Um, when, we, when we're setting up a new system like a health data sharing system, think about what's your purpose? What information do you need to, to accomplish that purpose? Um, if, if I want to, to do e-health with Vala, what do I need to know about Vala? Now, if I'm Vala's doctor, I need to know a lot about Vala. But if I'm a, like a community and a social network doing mental health online, super mm. stuff, then there's very little I want to know about Vala. So start by thinking, what do you need to know? What do you not need to know? And that's privacy. How do I deal with people without knowing everything? How do I preserve their privacy? So if we start design thinking about that, then I think that privacy will wash out. Um, mm. Privacy is not about secrecy. Privacy is not about hiding under a rock and, and refusing to tell anybody anything. We, you know, we're social beasts. We and, and and in healthcare, I need to tell people about this. Must no doubt about that. Um, How much of that design thinking should be focused on explaining why you need what you need and what you're going to do with it? Heaps, Vala. I mean, you you nailed it. Um, a lot of privacy is about restraint, so not collecting information in the first place, but then it's also about transparency. So explain to people what you know about them. In the world of big data and analytics, explain to people what you might know about them. Because next year, I'm going to have an algorithm that can predict the, the risk of heart disease. So let's be transparent about that. Let's explain to people why we've got the data, what are we going to do with it, and, 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 and who's benefiting. Like, if there's a bargain for data, and that's a lot of what this is about, is about mm -hmm. unleashing the power of data. If there's a bargain at the heart of data, then the data holders need to start being transparent and, and explaining to the little guy what's in it for them. Spot on. You know, that makes a lot of sense, right? And, and then that takes us into the conversation point, really, about what gets centralized, what gets decentralized. We've got folks like, oh, we're all Web 3.0, everything's going to be decentralized. I'm like, how's that going to work, right? And too much centralization is part of the problem that we have at this moment as well. And so what is, where does it fit? What's the right balance in, in your yeah. best judgment? 
I want to say that I, I really hope that we stop talking about decentralization as a bumper sticker because it is so confusing. It's an emotional word that people use for the same reason that we use identity as an emotional handle. We think it's, it's potent. We think people know what it means. They don't. Everybody's confused about it, but they won't admit that they're confused because, you know, I mean, it's new, it's sexy, it's, we're all proud. So let's be clear, um, we, we, we want to decentralize rulemaking and, and policy. We want communities to be able to, you know, you want doctors and patients to work out their own identities, set their own rules. That's so cool. Uh, a lot of identity in the past has been about governments telling people how they will be identified. So let's decentralize that. Um, let's not decentralize safety. Let's, for mm. God's sake, not have a metaverse that's like an everyone for themselves wild west roll your own crypto make your own wallets do your own source code inspections the world doesn't work like that people do not want to run their own wallets they do not want to run their own servers they don't want to run their own identity systems we tried that 20 years ago um i think that we need to decentralize cryptography so uh, uh ken and, and heather were, were really cool about people not wanting to get into the details. It's like driving a car. I mean, who knows how a car works these days? Let's um, not obsess about cryptography, but let's put it in the hands of people in, in these powerful, powerful devices we've got. So we move cryptography to the edge. We do stuff like private key management at the edge. Uh, we let IoT devices get more and more autonomous. They have embedded wallets. Um, they're, they're MCUs, microcontroller units with cryptography built in, super important. It's what the FIDO Alliance has done for many, many years. They have consumerized cryptography. They've consumerized um, safety in devices. Mm. And there's some very cool um, devices now in, uh, that are automating cryptography. So I'm following a company called HushMesh that is giving people personal hardware security modules in, a, in an attested, constantly monitored mesh. And the idea that you would automate the cryptography and have, have intelligent agents. So... Let's just jump to the metaverse. The powerful idea in the metaverse is that we will have meaningful, high fidelity digital agents, digital twins acting on our behalf. Mm. So how do you make that happen? I mean, under the covers, you need software, you need a tested software running a known good silicon. You need keys, you need all of that cryptography that is bound to the, the physical and the digital manifestations of the same thing. So how do you get that binding and like a supervised mesh of personal trustees that, that Hushmesh is working on looks like the way forward because it, it, it's, it's automating, it's pushing the cryptography at the edge. Um, it's removing the fragility. Like we are setting people up to fail. We do it all the time in tech, don't we? Um, at every level. People, you can read textbooks about this stuff. Yeah, as we if you're in the metaverse, there's this sort of wild west crypto bro mentality that people are going to look after themselves and... People are too fragile to do that. We, we can't set them up to fail. I see it every day, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter what type of wallet in the crypto space. It could be a Trezor or a hard wallet. It could be MetaMask or Coinbase, or you name it. It's, none of them are idiot proof. I, I, I can't tell you the number of people pointing to the wrong address, pointing to the wrong wallet, and their, <laughs> their, 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 their coins are going into minus infinity and not retrievable. We had a, a creator on our show a couple of weeks ago who's minting NFTs daily. And literally 48 hours after he was on our show, they stole a bunch of his NFTs. Um, and he really still, I don't think to date, understands how it happened. So when, when we talk about threats of 2022 and beyond, which was Ray's first question, and the fact that Accenture last week published their tech vision report that said in the very near future, adults are going to spend more than 50% of the time in the digital world than the, than the actual actual world. Mm. All this is is more information being gleaned from us. So, do you see non fungible token, you know, meteor meteoric rise and and Web three and metaverse and all these just really increasing significantly the threat vector and and, and the need for privacy and it, it just seems like we're heading towards absolutely people are getting more and more vulnerable because they are being yeah. asked to deal with stuff that they can't understand yeah um, nobody i mean let's be candid nobody really understands how the blockchain works really 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 smart people are still arguing about the energy cost of blockchain how is it possible mm -hmm. that you can argue about that stuff 
it's because blockchain is so mysterious and now NFTs are so mysterious. I don't think it's fair to, to put all of your eggs into this basket that nobody can understand. It, I don't know what- $41 billion, dollars, Steve, last year on NFT sales. Forty yeah, well, billion. It was 98 million the year before. Just to give you the two orders of magnitude growth in in 12 months, yeah. So let's be clear. I'm not obviously not denying that reality, um, and I don't want to predict that it's all going to bust. I think yeah. it will. Most of um, But it, it's still very niche, and the idea that the NFT technology is something that is going to be meaningful for all of us. The NFT is a cool thing when you've got a purely digital asset. And you want to know if it's original and you want to know that that pure digital sets of ones and zeros, that's the most intangible asset you can think of. Like your driver's license, ones... like your diploma from university. Like why does it well, have well, to be collectible art? Your diploma is a fact that has been established about you by a source of truth. And there's no doubt. I mean, if you want to know if I've got a diploma, you don't ask me and you don't ask the crowd, you ask my school. So that's the sort of artifact that gets digitized, but it's actually a, a truth. It's a fact that there's a source of truth. The, the really cool NFTs have no source of truth. They are generated by the crowd and the crowd yeah, but agrees. But to access that source of truth, there's friction involved. I'd rather show my diploma on my, my, my wallet uh, when I enter like the Harvard Club in New York. Like, boom, I it. you know, it's right there. You don't need to, I, I, I guess. Right. So, but there's no blockchain underneath an Apple wallet. I mean, I can get on an airplane, I can open a hotel room key with my Apple wallet. There, there ain't no blockchain because there's a series of sources of truth that the friction's taken out, they're digitized. True. You've got embedded cryptography that, 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 that seals the truth into the silicon. Very, very cool. Yeah. So it's what Heather and Ken said. What are you going to decentralize? I don't think you want to decentralize the university. You don't want to decentralize um, the, the cryptography. You want it in the hands of the people. And then you unpack that. What's the role of the blockchain? Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, right? I mean, I, I think you may have noticed that, you know, I, I've said this before and, and also in the book. I mean, if you're LinkedIn, like, shouldn't they just actually do verification of employment and where'd you go to school and skills? I mean, with 30 developers, 700 million users, 450 million active users, right, charging 15 to 19 dollars a call. They could make more money doing that than what they're making right now. I mean, well, remember you know. we, we wrote a report at Constellation about seven years ago when Microsoft bought LinkedIn and we were trying to work out, we said some pretty smart people at the table trying to work out what they're going to do with it. I think we published a report with three different theories. I'm going to reread that and see, see how it's panned out. But <laughs> They missed it, right? We handed it to them. No, but, but hey, let me ask you, this. how do we build privacy by design then? Well, what's the right way to build privacy by design? So well, you, you sit down, like Vala was, was saying, you sit down, you work out what you need to know about people. What do you not need to know about people? Where are you going to get the data from? Um, how do you know that the data is true? If I need to know that, that Ray is a Tesla driver, or if I need to know his blood pressure, different facts, different sources of truth, don't mash it all up. I mean, the privacy problem that we have is that we mash it all up. And let's, let's stand guard against against the platforms that appear to, to, to not want to mash stuff up. Platforms want to know everything about everybody. I wish the platforms were platforms. I wish the platforms were solid, sound ground upon which communities will build their own stuff. Um, but instead, what they are is enormous sponges that is kind of, again, I don't know what the right metaphor is, but, but they are like sitting underneath us, intimately connected to everything we do, um, watching everything that we do, gathering data, instrumenting what we do. Um, call me cynical, but I look at it, Web3 as another platform play. Uh, I think mm. the, the, the businesses that are, that are championing Web3 um, have got an agenda. Um, I'm not paranoid about that. Um, I, I think that these things will get decoupled and we'll get a bit more law and order in the metaverse. That'll, that'll be cool. But yeah, privacy by design is about being really clear about what you want to know and what you don't want to know. know. Um, and that, you know, really, really cool that, that we've heard, heard our guests talk about being much clearer about what identity is really all about. And, and that's a good sign that we're going to get better privacy outcomes. Steve, when we talk about hyper automation, you know, when I talk to CIOs, they definitely have automation and productivity and cost reduction uh, and value creation at the speed of need, all of these things top of their agenda. Uh, but at the same time, so few have folks responsible to look at ethical and humane use of software and how the automation 
uh, can potentially drift away from their brand when when they don't truly understand how the decisions are made. There's no there's no uh, reverse engineering on how they got to the specific recommendation because you know it's mm. ML and it's just iterating on its own and God knows. And by the way, they're accurate, somewhat accurate predictions and recommendations. They just really don't know how they got there. Uh, how much of that is going to really be a tug of war when you talk about privacy security? Mm. And at the same time, you're on the hook to hyper automate because you're trying to squeeze as much as you can from the li you know, limited resources that you have. Well, one of the nicest things that I've seen in the last couple of years is technologists um, losing that move fast, break stuff mentality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agile um, has got a dark side to it and <laughs> it it's got to do with people moving so fast that they're not asking why. Yeah. So I don't know about you. When I taught my kids, you know, the rules of life, I was asking them to always say why. Yeah. Um, look at it any way you like. Challenge authority, whatever. I mean, be independent. Ask why. Now, listen. The software, founder of LinkedIn for years said, if if you're not shipping your first, you know, pilot, you're 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 losing. I don't, I'm trying to paraphrase what 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 he said, but yeah, you're right. That mentality of you know, and look, I don't want to jump on a soundbite, but but if that's what he's saying, then that is intrinsically unethical because mm. it's losing the why. You are empowering people. You're giving them license to move so quickly that they forget why. So every coder knows the experience of going back to some, something that they wrote last year and they can't remember why it does what it does. So it's got a bug in it and they're scratching their heads like, why is the code doing that? It's because they didn't comment it. It's because they didn't write down, why did I write these five lines of Python? Now, at every level of tech, we're losing track of why because we're not taking time. Now, I'm not saying slow everything down, yeah. but I am saying take some time. And, and I think ethics comes down to being really clear about why. And as soon as you can start to really force yourself to ask why, Benevolence. like why why am I logging um, what the music Ray is listening to in his Tesla? Well, I mean, I'm, well, if I'm honest with myself, I'm probably doing that because the company told me to because we're going to monetize that later on. Yeah. And then you start to really, you know, reflect and, 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 and act ethically. So I don't think ethics is a, is a mystery. And I don't want to go around teaching ethics to people in, um, in school as such, because it's deeper than that. And it's not something that you're just going to read. You're not going to read about the trolley problem and all of a sudden know how to make a safe self-driving car. Ethics is, is much more fundamental than that. And it doesn't require a big university course. It requires people to be encouraged to ask why why they're being asked to do what they do, why do they make the design decisions that they do? Steve, is this a generational issue? Because personalization uh -huh. seems to be, when people talk about the currency of the new digital economy, speed, personalization, scale, you hear that all on, you know, over and over. Does an 18-year-old yeah. care? Does a 22-year-old care about this? Or, 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 or is, is, is this more of a, you know... They issue? don't. But then the question is that we, you know, again, textbooks are written about, the psychology of, of risk taking mm -hmm. and the personality of risk taking. We do not let 18 year old kids um, write road safety policy for the government. Right. And yet so we have let 18 year old so mentality write the privacy strategy of the biggest companies on earth. <laughs> um, now that partly is because they just didn't even understand what it means to be, to be private yeah, because yeah. it's not part of your instinct at 18. Yeah. Uh, and it's also because there's always been a terrible commercial agenda in the social media networks mm -hmm. that they want to know everything about you for a purpose. They want to monetize what they know about you. Yeah. So there's a there's a pretty obvious um, double play there. Well, Steve, yeah. Yeah. as Reid Hoffman said, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. So that's what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But still. <laughs> Sorry, I did, I totally butchered what he said, but the spirit of it was ship it. Right. Don't you know Jim Collins? Pr pr Perfect is the enemy of good, kind of sort of, but, you know. And, yeah, Conscious. there's always truth in all of that. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of truth in what's, saying, what's being said there. Don't let perfection be the, be the, um, the enemy of the good. Um, prototype, get stuff out there, let it break, fix it later. But um, don't, don't let that fast. be licensed to be careless yeah. Yeah, but and to turn a blind eye. Don't just feel fast, right? So, yeah. yeah. All right, Steve. Vice President and Principal Analyst at Constellation Research. Thank you, folks. Underscore Thank you, Steve. Um, we'll see you in the green room. Thank you so much for being here, Steve, and, of course, getting up early for us. So, It's Thank worth so it. Much. It's a deep pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for those of you watching, Steve is dialing in from Australia. It's 5 a.m. So, 
and 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 Larry is in Antarctica. And uh, no, I'm kidding. So, no. Yeah. Well, it's way too cold there. <laughs> what a pleasure to have Larry Dignam, one of our favorite guests, uh, uh, editor in chief at Salonis. Uh, Salonis is a global leader in execution management. Salonis pioneered the process mining category 10 years ago when they first developed the ability to automatically x ray processes and find inefficiencies. Salonis is currently valued, I didn't know this, uh, Larry, at $11 billion based on a $1 billion raise in Series D round in uh, 2021. Larry is the former editor in chief of ZDNet and has covered technology industry transformation trends for more than two decades, publishing articles in numerous major media outlets. You can follow Larry on Twitter at LDignan, D I G N A N. Welcome back, Larry, to Disrupt TV, and congratulations on a new chapter in, in your career. Yeah, good to be here. I was just trying to see how many life changes I could smush into one year, and uh, yeah, so here we are. <laughs> Oh, that's right. That well, I don't, you know, you know, I, I moved, don't have to got get married, the... got a new job, sent a kid to college. Yeah, got a lot going on. Minted your first oh, yes, NFT, bought Bitcoin. <laughs> that's amazing. Married, new house, new job. Oh my god, and new college. Yeah. Wow, wow, Larry, just, that was just what racking a it banner up. Year. So, yeah, <laughs> I didn't lose my mind, so that was all good. It was more about the is this what is Salonis Media? What is this all about? Let's let's start there. So so basically, it comes down to the core, which is you know my passions B two B tech, um, everything, and it's the tech meets business sort of intersection. And Salonis has so many customer stories, and there's so much to cover in that ecosystem. Because if you think about it, everything on earth has a process behind it. So, you know, I was never a fan of Beats, but now I can cover a little bit of everything um, across industries. And there's there's process optimization that's not even happening. Um, you know, industries that there are new use cases. There's just a lot to cover. Uh, the other thing is um, there's so many intersections with process optimization and executing better when you think about inflation supply chain all these companies need to figure out how much they pass on and how much margin they keep um in terms of pricing and we're already seeing consumers push back on on the pricing changes so companies are going to have to get more efficient in a hurry uh, you know if, uh, most people know you were the big cheese at zdnet and legendary career in the space and you always reference use cases. You wanted to show tangible evidence of how innovation technology is used. Did Salonis just because I, my sense is you could have gone anywhere. But I guess I want to know <clears throat> what's specific about Salonis. Was it the fact that they really demonstrated evidence to you in terms of how technology is used to remove blind spots, increase efficiency, grow? Uh, and obviously, as I said, it's an incredibly successful multi-billion dollar company. It must have been a hard decision for you to leave ZDNet. It, it was. Um, it was also just kind of time. Um, but there, there are a bunch of, you know, for one, I think execution management is going to be, you know, it's a movement. Um, and I think it was one of the first times I was able to see, like, you know, how value was created and things I actually understood. Cash flow, things like that. They weren't wrapping in the TCO and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was one big plus. The other thing is just from a career perspective, I, I have this habit of making sure I'm never the smartest person in the room. And as long as you can basically guarantee, I will never be the smartest person in the room. <laughs> uh, so it's I'm just, in that club, a lot of I'm in that club. <laughs> yeah, he acts to talk to. And, um, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll always be the, you know, Maybe Steve. not the least smart, but certainly <laughs> won't be in the top whatever percentile. So, so it's just a career motto I go by. I love it. Well, no, this is great, right? And, and, and part of your role, you get to look at you know, a whole bunch of larger issues as well, um, customer stories. And, and, and with that, that means you also get to cover you know, kind of the interesting things that are happening out here in the marketplace. So let, let's take a fun one here that we uh, are talking about is, you know, comments about TSMC and smartphone demand. 
are smartphones dying? Are they picking up speed? Like what's going on? Right. Yeah. I think that's, I would couple those comments with, uh, I think counterpoint research had a thing on Motorola this week, how they're number three. I think you're starting to see consumers across. Motorola is number three in what? In North America, smartphone market share. Wow. Which what? I yeah, dig Motorola because not... I, I like the portfolio. I like the value approach. Um, it's scaled pretty well because of Lenovo. Um, but I think you're seeing substitutional effects everywhere. Right. You know, you know, uh, CPG companies, you know, they, they, they basically manage through this by taking out a few more potato chips from the bag and charging you the same. Right. It was all all sneaky price increases. Hmm. Um, now people are starting to substitute and you're starting to see that, you know, because it's all you have one budget as a consumer. And when you're looking at your gas bill basically doubling when you're driving you're yeah. looking at things like, well, do I need that premium smartphone or I do I need that middle of the road one? Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of substitution going on. So if you're a company, you're, you're basically looking at this and whether it's your processes, how you're automating, just how you're operating, period. You're mm -hmm. going to have to figure out how much you pass on to the customer and how much you preserve and eat on your margin. And we're seeing this a lot in retail already. So like Target, they made a specific move to say, you know, we're going to eat some of this margin because that's our value prop. Um, you see Walmart doing it with their scale. They can, you know, they, they have such scale that they can keep prices lower. Um, but you're going to see, you know, uh, you're going to see consumers doing this and businesses doing it. You're just going to have to get more efficient across the board because it's, it's just, it's gonna, it has to happen, whether it's supply chain, where you're trying to figure out how to get stuff from point A to point B, whether you're CPG company, retail, whatever, you're going to have to be more efficient. Um, and I haven't even tossed in like the labor market, right? Yeah. Where you're, you're going to be more efficient because you're going to have to get more work done with less people. Um, and there's just a lot of, you know, there's going to be a lot of science behind it to be data driven, but there's also yeah. going to be a lot of art to it, too. Sure, sure. I love it. I love when you talk about efficiency and you talk about getting to a grounded truth and understanding processes. And I love the terminology of like the X-ray of your business that your company uses to, you know, understand perception versus reality. So, uh as defined uh, by, by Salonas, process mining is defined as an analytical discipline for discovering, monitoring, and improving processes as they actually are and not as you think they might be. Right. Uh, it, and, and so I think that's an incredibly powerful gap to, uh, to understand. And most companies don't have an X-ray of their processes. And you only find out when they invite you know, external folks to come in and, and show blind spots and potential myths that exist within the business. So how do you uh, differentiate process mining, as, as I just read, uh, as compared to, for example, RPA? The way I think the simple way I think about it is... Um, Process mining is what you do first, and then okay. comes the RPA. Okay. Because think about RPA, you know, if you use Gartner's terms or whatever, it's, it's sort of like a digital worker. Yeah. Um, and Garbage in, garbage out. So you better do the mining. Well, yeah, I don't know if it's garbage in or garbage out, but you're still hiring a bunch of bots that you got to yes. manage. And my rule of thumb is I really don't want to scale up a team to be, you know, really huge because then you got to manage the monster. Um, so the way to think about it is it's a tool that can be used, but if you look at the processes first, you can use it better. So one way to think about the process and, you know, you think about it end to end, right? So you can automate anything up front, right? So say you automate all the stuff on the front end of some process, and then you have humans in the middle. And if the humans become a bottleneck, yeah. then it doesn't quite work out, right? Or if people have to go off script from the process and what we call variants or whatever, then you get all these other things, right? So you got to think about things holistically. So there's no magic bullet per se, but you got to think about how you're using your various automation technologies or whatever you're using on that digitization, digitization layer. Yeah. You need to think about that in terms of, you got to think about it holistically. 
right? Because there's no magic bullets to any of this. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is you just have to think about your processes on an ongoing basis and continually tweak. And then, so you know, ideally get to the point where you're triggering some kind of action. So, Larry, you're, you're the Salonis Media Chief, uh, Editor-in-Chief. You're responsible for shaping the narrative and educating and inspiring the market. One billion dollar raise, Series D, 11 billion valuation. Uh, I, 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 have you had a chance to really think about how you communicate and message this incredible company in the next 12 months? How long does it take for editor-in-chief to really understand the heart and soul of a company and what makes it unique in the market? Or did you already know before because you were editor-in-chief of ZDNet? So. Well, I, I did some <laughs> due diligence for sure. Um, but, you know, the narrative is that's kind of the marketing department. Yeah. I'm kind of, you know, the, the idea here is that every vendor is a publisher. Um, true. Wow. So that is true. I'm kind that of, is true. you know, I, I'm true. on an island yet not. So I'm kind of horizontal, kind of vertical. Um, end of day, it just comes down to, I just want to tell like cool stories. Um, <laughs> and the other weird thing is that being what a great vendor, formula for those of you listening, just you know, tell, just, I always say smart people stories, use simple right? language, smart people use simple language. Just, I just want to just, tell cool yeah. stories. <laughs> that, that's all I want to do. Um, <laughs> Awesome. And, you know, the weird part is that a vendor, you actually see some of these cool, you see a lot more cool stories. Like I'm seeing things that like in the press, you kind of go through this approval process to see what's going on and they may <laughs> want to talk about it or may not. And so you don't hear about half the stuff. Um, it's still a problem, though, because I can't go out and yap about things customers yeah. don't want to talk about. But yeah. it's nice to know. Right. You, you get a few cool ideas. And, you know, so. So you get educated more, like you actually see what's going on, even if you can't tell the stories. So it's, you know, that's a balancing act trying to figure out for sure. That's terrific. That's terrific. Go back. Making pro process mining cool. I love that. I love it's that. Uh, it's going to be, I think it's going to be something that's going to be embedded pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think, and, and I think the macro conditions, like I think the macroeconomic trends in IT are kind of merging. And I, I think that's IT is going to technologies are going to be the way you're going to have to solve some of these issues. Yeah. Um, just because I, your customer is going to have limits, right? Look, you're you're look. not going. You're half. You're going to have to just become more efficient because there's no choice, right? You can't raise your prices ten percent. Yeah. So what do you do? Right. Well, let's just, I think, we, I, you know, in my mind, the supply chain failed us, uh, not, not to their doing, but design thinking principles on centralizing supply chain. And, and it took, a, obviously, a big health crisis. But at the end of the day, leads to inflation. I mean, process mining is going to become or has already become top of mind because you really have to design systems better. And you, you, I don't know how you do that unless you understand the inefficiencies that exist in your current processes. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know if I'd say the supply chain necessarily failed us. It was built for a different time, right? It was, <laughs> yeah, it was built for, it was built for lean inventory where nothing was going to go wrong. Yeah, and, and yeah, I suppose. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't like, mean to. I don't mean to put Intel, the hammer. Try to get a Ford Bronco or a couch or a fridge or a, you know oh, I mean? it's, yeah, it's insane. <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, two but years if, for a say, for a chair. Say you were say you were uh, on Wall Street, yeah. and Whirlpool said in 2019, we are going to hoard components mm. for our supply chain. They would have got crushed. Yeah. Right. So, you know, like now a it was just no, it, there was just no scenario planning or maybe there wasn't just we couldn't execute because the problem was yeah. larger than we could handle. But well, how often do pandemics happen? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. you know what I mean? Like I it, it's it's kind of a, you know, they call them black swans for a reason. If you saw them yeah. coming, they wouldn't be black swans. Well, it's that every is true. Year. That is true. That's kind of what happens. So. But yeah. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a. You know, so so I don't know if I'd say supply chain failed, but yeah, it's going to have to change a lot. Yeah. yeah so so we're looking at this. Let's 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 talk about another interesting thing. Um, you know, Meta, Facebook, Apple, folks got duped. This is the funniest story <laughs> out there, right? People posed as legal enforcement, and what did they do? They got conned. Um, and I'm not terribly surprised by that. 
right? Remember when the internet came out and everybody said, you know, everybody can be a dog on the internet or whatever that saying was? <laughs> yeah, that uh, cartoon. Security, <laughs> yeah, it was a cartoon. Security, I don't think is, you know, I mean, more interesting to me was that 16 and 17 year old, those two teenagers got arrested in the UK for that big hack. These were teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. They're going to, assuming they don't stay in jail and their, their record gets wiped when they're 18, they're going to have such great careers. Yeah. <laughs> like, like really their, oh, their biggest totally. mistake was talking a lot of smack on social, but just from a resume builder, it's kind of impressive. <laughs> That's awesome. That is true. That is, oh, that, is, that is definitely, that is definitely true. Quite um, the coup. Uh, what's, what's, uh, What's on your radar in terms of emerging tech? We talked about a lot of previous guests talked about privacy, security, blockchain, web, Meta, Web three. Are there particular areas of interest for you in the next in the next twelve months? Uh, I'm I'm looking at those macro meets IT themes. Okay. Uh, I think sustainability is going to be way more operationalized. Totally. Um, I'll be honest, with, metaverse is something I think about not at all. No. I just don't buy it. <laughs> Not at all. Um, no. I'm going to invite buy it. you to the metaverse, man. <laughs> I would buy it from. It's going to be. A, it's going to be a while. Um, I buy it from an arms dealer thing. So if a bunch of people, if a bunch of people think the metaverse is going to be a thing, it's not Meta. I'd buy Nvidia or whatever. It's the people that make the enabling technologies because yeah, on the off chance somebody's right. And if they're not right, well, guess what? They're still going to make gobs of money. Um, that's how I'm thinking about it. Because I, I don't, it's, I, I have a hard time seeing it happening. And we the biggest the thing is just the goggles a little bit different. and well, all we, that. We look, we look at it a little bit differently, right? We, we think about the, um, there's like the devices, right? Fine, right? There's like the worlds, there's the DAOs, there's the value exchange that's happening in the crypto world. And then there's Web3.0 technology. That with the intersection of creators and people who are buying in these marketplaces, that's what we see out there, right? But if it's just worlds, I totally get what you're saying. But uh, but yeah, but we'll see, right? We're we're really early. We have no idea. We're who in the process is. of moving Disrupt TV to the metaverse. Uh, we're just working on Ray's icon. So oh, oh, great. We're working on icons. We're working <laughs> just, on icons. Just so. just pick one where I have legs, okay? Like, <laughs> I don't I don't want to. Don't you want to be chopped like off? It's like Nintendo, like and yeah, and Facebook. I, no one has legs. I, I, I don't want to float around like a weeble. I, I just know. want better I, hair. I just want better yeah, hair. Yeah, you know, it's kind of. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's. I think there probably is some work application of some sort. Um, but you know, for me, when I get interested, I, I like those things that, you know, it's kind of reaching that that major league hype, and now I need to see the crash, mm -hmm. and then you kind of look at it and see what's going on. Yeah. We are here with the forever I'm waiting, I'm waiting optimist, for the, Larry I'm waiting Dingen. for the tulip mania model, you know, the tulip mania kind of thing to happen. And then, then I'll look at it more. We're here with Larry just, Dingen, editor-in-chief at Solonis. You can follow him on Twitter at L-D-I-G-N-A-N. Thank you so much for being here and congratulations, congratulations. on your new role. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. We'll Thanks. see you in the green room. All right, take Will care. So. Uh, what a banner year. Married move to a new house, new job, and your child goes to college as a freshman. <laughs> can't, can't beat can't, that. How many life know, events I, can you roll into I, one I, there? Maybe getting a St. Bernard as a dog or something. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what else you can do. That, we'll find out in the green room if you got a dog yeah. or not. <laughs> so. That's amazing. Um, oh, geez, I was going to ask you to recap four extraordinary minds. Um, yeah, please do. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no. please. look, uh, look. This has been exciting, right? Well, I mean, what we are saying is, is this movement where um, our ownership of our data, our ownership of who we are, what we represent, um, is starting to take center stage. We've talked about this in the past about having data portability, having the ability to manage our own information and insights. We're not good at that, but we need surrogates to do that. And somewhere between centralization and decentralization, there's an answer, and people. Are working really hard here as we go from web 2.0 to web 3.0. Big things are happening there. Um, but 
right? With that happening, right? This notion of like, you know, who controls this or what, how this gets done, right? That's an argument that's going to be perpetual. I mean, we're always going to be arguing how much do we give up? How much do we get, right? What are we trying to share? What are we trying to achieve, right? And, and, and there's no easy answer and there hasn't been for some time, even before the world of the digital uh, or, or the web or the or internet where we are today. Um, it's only going to get more complicated as we add more modalities. And, and I think that's, that's where the challenge sits. So, but, but the notion of you know, where we are and, and what's going on in the larger economy where Larry's talking about, you know, what's happening. I mean, yeah, I mean, this inflation thing is real. These supply chains are real. We have five eyes, right? Inventory, interest rates, inflation, um, invasion, and infection. These five eyes, I mean, have are macro forces that just wreaked havoc on almost every model we have, uh, which really leads us to the concept that we talk about called the great refactoring. Lots of things are changing. It's not going to go to a new normal. It's not going to go back to where we were, but something is changing, and we're living in the middle of it, and we're trying to describe it as it's happening. And, and so you'll hear more about this in future episodes. So yeah, back great, to you, Bala. No, great, great, <laughs> great, great, great summary. I can't believe in your summary, you introduced five eyes at the top of your head. But no, you know, I mean, I, I would have thought the vaccine ID would have been an incredible accelerant in terms of decentralized universal identity. And I think it has been an accelerant. And I think people understand portability of data and ownership of data with the right efficacy without having to go to a central source to validate again, remove friction and allow you to be, um, you know, more mobile and, and ownership of data. Next week, we have episode 274. Ooh. We have Arthur Phillip, Chief Growth Officer at Google Sapien joining us. Uh, wow. We have Lewis Smithingham, Director of Creative Solutions at Media.Monks. <laughs> and we have Sam, Sam Simons, CSO of NFT Stadium. So we're going to continue the conversation. We've had a number of guests in the last two months really teaching us about this world that's exploding uh, in interest. Um, you know, and so Sam will help with that as well. And next week is the Bitcoin 2022 conference in Miami on top of that. So a lot of stuff going on, if, if I remember. So this is going to be pretty Yeah, and if you're only invited if you have 10 plus Bitcoin. So I'm out, raise in, and uh, enjoy the conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thanks, everybody. So, thanks, everyone. <laughs> if it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV, 11 a.m., 2 p.m. East, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll see you around. Oh!